In this uh, lecture, we will look at uh, two ways in which citizens affect politics, which are not in the Constitution or not in the laws, and that is civil society and public opinion. Okay, so what the heck is civil society? Well, think it this way. Civil society is that space of political life, which is not run by the state and the organizations that directly participate in politics, like political parties. And it's also that part of social life that is not run on a market basis. And finally, that part of human life not conducted in an individual manner. So it's in the middle of the area where the market, the state, and the family meet together. It is thus, very, thus a very broad and ambiguous co uh, concept. Simply put, it is those parts of our social life that are not resolved on market or political principles. However, civil society is not insulated from either markets or politics. The important thing is that it does not work on their principles, even though the participants of civil society also participate in the other two elements. The insulation from those two means that civil society is voluntaristic to a great extent. The concept can encompass any social group which is characterized by regular voluntaristic interaction of the members. This goes from bowling leagues to fraternities to churches to labor unions to veterans groups and so on. The law, the rule is that you participate because you want. You don't participate because you feel social and legal pressure to do so. Your family technically is actually a legal institution. Your parents are legally and you as a child are legally required to do some things. So a lot of the depth of a family relationship is, of course, voluntaristic. But that's why a family is not exactly an example of civil society. But all the other groups, you know, you participate because you want to. There's not necessarily any social stigma or any state laws that force you. You just want to do it. You want to do something with other people and you work together about it. And you do it on the basis of not trying to make a profit and not trying to necessarily run for office, so getting into politics. And yes, even cl gun clubs are elements and examples of civil society, like the one uh, Mr. Hill is part of. Pack. Guess who's running for an unprecedented fourth term as president of the Arlen Gun Club? I'll give you a hint. He made love to my wife last night. Dang it, Dale. I didn't let Bill put a personal ad up there, and I sure as hell won't let that up. Macaroon, I've got entrance wound size and exit wound size. Dale, every year I vote for you just to get my hands on one of your fine macaroons. Well, in that case, Jim, take two and vote twice. <laughs> Mad Dog. Cookie? That's off, boys. It's the first lady. <laughs> if you're not going to respect the man, Mad Dog, at least respect the office. Perhaps considering all of this, we can come to a possible schema. A uh, civil society group is characterized A, by volunteer or at least membership not enforced by the state. B, it's non-profit. Making money is not the main goal. It might seek to make some money in order to support its operations, but it's not a profit-oriented enterprise. C, regular and intense membership requirements. You do not just send a check once a year, but you actually have to participate in meetings, volunteer for activities, and so on. D, it manages something of value to the members. It's still answering a question of who gets what and how. And E, membership is broad but regulated. Anybody, people, like there are no strict rules for membership, but it's still regulated. There's still some requirements you have to meet in order to be a member. Again, this is just a very broad schema. Don't try to find an exact definition of this. You're not going to be successful. Now, why are they a big deal? Well, they provide alternatives to market and politics. For starters, civil society institutions provide alternatives to those things. Take, for example, the work of charitable groups. They offer people who have lost in politics and lost in markets an alternative source for goods. 
This helps society at large manage the level of political stress created by the distribution of scarce goods and offers individuals another form for seeking redress of wrongs. There literally are another option for people than the state or the market, and that's an important thing. Because politics and market forces have losers and winners, but civil society doesn't necessarily have to do that. But also, participation in communal decision-making is something people learn within civil society organizations. Most families tend to have hierarchical structures for good or for bad, which makes them good for teaching responsibility, but usually bad for teaching, taking part in the decision process with peers. Your mom or dad are not going to put on a vote whether the kids can have tattoos. Consequently, people tend to learn democracy in civil society. They run for club president or club official choir leader, etc. They vote on club budget issues. They decide if someone should be expelled. Very few civil society clubs use force or market power to decide these issues. Most of them decide this on consensus or democratic voting. Finally, civil society can act as a check and partner to government. Indeed, governments at many levels, especially in the United States, use civil society organizations to help manage projects and assure some feedback and citizen participation and distribution, for example, parent-teacher associations. Using civil society thus helps government in several ways. It provides feedback about voter satisfaction with policies, gives a stake to people in those policies as a way to decrease resistance to, resistance to implementation, and from an electoral point of view, provides opportunities for electioneering by politicians who use civil society organizations and meetings to meet voters and get their message across. But meetings can be very boring, you know. That's one thing holding us back from civil society. You will now be placed into conference. Hey Dave, it's Kate. Wait till you hear from Mike. He's so enthusiastic about this project. This is gonna be a game changer, Dave. This project has a lot of people, myself included, very, very excited. So, here's the status. The BRD is in V3. We just need an SVP to sign up on the RFP. Now, this initiative might impact our PNL, but as an FYI, the PMO has looked at the ROI of using an ASP. And we don't think TCO will be an issue, but BCP and DR still might be. What's so exciting is that this project is more than just directional, it's strategic. We think it's actionable. Straight our thought leadership, leverages our synergies without trying to boil the ocean. And at the end of the day, is a paradigm-shifting value add. That's what's got everyone so excited. Are you as excited about this project as we are, Dave? Absolutely. Intercall. One more reason why we know civil society boring or not is a big deal for democracy is simply that totalitarian regimes have always destroyed independent civil society. They have destroyed it by outright bans, co-opting organizations, or simply filling them with informants. For example, one of the first things the Nazi party did when in power was to prohibit any scouting organizations independent of the Nazi youth or label unions independent of the Nazi party. In Russia, the Soviet regime followed similar policies. So it's obviously it's important for democracy because the states that despise our types of parliamentary or representative democracy hate civil society organizations. The importance of civil society in America was first argued by a conservative Frenchman, Alexis Tocqueville, who came to the US in the 1840s to see what made the country tick. What really surprised him was the willingness and intensity of Americans to form every kind of association, from church groups to sports leagues, which was a stark contrast to the more individualist French. He thus concluded that this willingness to work together made democracy work in the US. However, Robert Putman, a political scientist, after careful study, made the argument that this impetus toward civil society in the US was waning. And if civil society and democracy are related, the consequences might be dire. Well, what happened is that uh, put one first look at turnout rates for presidential elections and midterm elections. Remember this 
uh, graphic from the start of the class, and he noticed that uh, there was a decline of these around the 1950s and around, especially in the period in the 1970s to roughly the 2000s, okay? So he was looking essentially at the period from, let's say, 1960 to 2000. And there's obviously, despite some uh, variation, a general trend of decline. And I mean, there's a general trend of decline in, in fully, but there is a trend of decline, uh, especially after 1975. Then he saw this. He saw that there is a very sharp decline in bowling uh, league uh, civil society organizations, especially around the same period, in the 1970s, essentially. Okay. And then he showed that there he showed that there is increase in the association between people watching a lot of television and being uh, nasty to each other here giving a finger to another driver okay uh, and he also noticed that people who watch a lot of television and are nasty to each other also are less likely to work on a community project okay so he uh, saw that the decline in civil society organizations like bowling leagues is correlated with an increase in TV viewing which is correlated with an increase of public nastiness and a decrease in volunteeristic work for civil society projects. This led him to the conclusion that these are all interrelated uh, with the decline of the interest of Americans uh, in participating in partisan activities, especially after the 1970s. Okay, people attended less often political rallies or speeches, and even less often worked for a political party. So for Putman, this gets connected with low levels of participation in politics, high levels of apathy, uh, and generally a collapse of civil trust and public trust. When it came to the causes, different uh, explanations have been advanced. Some people blame the entry of women into the labor force, especially after the 1970s. Uh, they argue that women were responsible for a lot of the civil society organizations and their work at home, their unpaid work at home, provided men with the time to engage in their own civil society organizations and with their entry into the labor force that was lost. Now, the pros of this entry was the increase in the production of economy and women liberation, the cons is less time for volunteering. The problem with such an explanation is that both men and women numbers go down uh, and many men are single and they still don't participate in volunteeristic organizations as much as they used to do when women uh, were forced to stay at home. Others uh, blame a more mobile economy with people moving around for jobs. I mean, I've moved around four times for jobs already in my life. Um, many of you might have moved a lot more and thus not having the time or the ability to put roots in a community, to get interested in uh, participating in community projects and so on. The problem is, statistically, we know that Americans seem to be more stable now compared to the past without any change in their willingness of participating in community projects. Others have accused changes in family dynamics, blaming more divorce, less marriages, more single parent households. Others have uh, blamed technological change in leisure, accusing your Xbox and PS5 probably now of taking you away from your participation in civil society organization things. But my opinion, uh, is that it probably has to do maybe more with the Pendleton Act of 1883. If you go back to the slide, you will see that there's a stark fall from high levels of participation in the 19th century around there in the 1890s, which essentially took jobs in the government away from being something that could be decided politically, okay? So for a lot of people, it seems their participation in politics was driven by the promise of a civil service job. And once that was taken away, a big part of the population just stopped caring 
And then the part that was left carrying lost even more interest in the 1970s, especially when Jim Crow's end ended white domination of civil service jobs in the South. So maybe it's not all about virtue and how we live. Maybe we're just cynical creatures and we don't have something to gain out of participating in politics and participating in elections. We don't do it. There's your question. But maybe it's not all bad because some civil society organizations were not that different from criminal groups like the Ku Klux Klan, for example. Neither you gentlemen. Another way in which citizens participate in politics is through public opinion, which are the collective attitudes and beliefs of individuals on one or more issues. Essentially, what do the people think on a specific issue? Now, public opinion is an ambiguous concept. Everybody has an opinion, and if you take any two of us, chances are our opinions are very varied. Public opinion is when one tries to figure out what we all think. As a result, public opinion only makes sense when focused on specific issues. Public opinion is not your political opinion. Instead, it is in a way the political opinion of a fictitious schizophrenic entity, which is an amalgam of the political opinions of each one of us. Now, how can we get to public opinion? Well, one could try to ask a lot of people. In a way, town halls are exactly that. A politician hopes he can meet a lot of people and get to hear what they think. However, town halls will tend to present a skewed picture of public opinion. Why? Because people choose to go to town halls. So there is a bias there. There's a selection bias. Only those who are activists or really angry or really supportive of the politician will go there. Majority is probably not going to participate. So you will get the opinion of those that really want to talk to you rather than the average citizen. Elections is another way. However, elections are very costly and take time to organize. We cannot have elections every day and we may not want that anyhow. Participatory radical democracy people would like that, but maybe not the rest of us. Direct democracy initiatives like referenda, recall options and so on may help, but they tend to have the negatives of elections and town hall meetings. Another way 
is to conduct public opinion polls. These are cheaper than referenda elections and get us to be conducted fairly often. But if not conducted in a very precise way, they can present a skewed picture. Why should we care? Well, democracy means the rule of the people. Okay, and means that the will of the people should play a role, maybe decisive, maybe contributory to political decision making. But the people as individuals or the people as a collective, elections are far too infrequent to be able to be considered as adequately capturing the will of the people. The democracy that is only a democracy once every two, four or ten years is not going to fare well. However, the point is not so much what I or you think, but what we think. Democracy is not a veto system like the old Polish Commonwealth, where one person can block all decisions. It is a majoritarian system. Thus, we care about what the majority and the minority think. We care about aggregate numbers. To be a bit Marxist, we care about masses. Another reason for this is that while individual citizens tend to be a political self-interested actors because public opinion is because public opinion is an aggregation, the minority that is more active and the majority that is less active will tend to average closer to the ideal democratic citizen group than the apolitical individual. Thus, while as individuals we may not live up to the promise of democracy as masses, we might be closer to the idea of the ideal democratic citizen. We should also care because politicians care. Politicians and opinion leaders do care and spend a lot of scarce resources trying to determine public opinion. Politicians, indeed, the only part of political science they actually like and find useful is that part of political science that is focused on measuring public opinion. So if you go into a political science degree, if you focus on surveys and polls and public opinion measuring, you will have a job, a very good job. And indeed, it is so important to get accurate understandings of public opinion that even authoritarian regimes do unofficial secret pollings to try to get accurate information about what their people think, even if officially they present supportive numbers. If we take as an example, how do we measure up as citizens as a public politics? If we take as an example this uh, Pew Survey International Affairs from 2022, Depends. It depends. On some issues, Americans have a very good idea. On some others, they don't. But there's nowhere like an overwhelming 100% knowledge. And that's similar to domestic political issues. Two things are a bit better because of the polarization of the last 10 years, which has motivated a lot of people to go out and learn more. When it comes to attitudes, we are more tolerant in general, but still intolerant in particular. 90% of Americans tend to support the First Amendment, but when you ask about specific cases like Nazis, communist, activist, atheist, it goes down to very low. More educated people are either more tolerant or more able to hide their prejudices. It's not really important which of the two is true for the function of democracy. You just need people to act as if they are tolerant. Remember, it's all about acting, what you present out to the world, not what you really think. That same thing with undermining the legitimacy of the state. You have to act, not what you think. When it comes to participation in politics, especially voting, but also creating parties and so on, while the 2020 elections had record numbers for the United States of America, this is still tiny compared to many other of the democracies to which we compare the United States of America. Americans just don't participate as much in politics or at least presidential politics as many other people do. Now, the next question is simple. How do we form our political opinions? Well, there are four sources for this. First of all, we'll form our political opinions from our families, either in agreement with our family or in stark contrast to them. Then we form political opinions in our schools and education, uh, you know, what our professors teach us, what our teachers teach us, and so on. Then we form it by the groups we create, the peer groups, the social so civil society groups that we participate in, or our friends groups. And finally, we can be impacted by salient political and social events, like 9-11, for example, for the United States of America, or in the case of Sweden, the murder of Da Hammarskjöld, uh, which can, you know, leave a mark on us uh, that leads us to specific political decisions. So I guess the 
January 6th uh, attempted coup d'etat is also an example of a salient event for a lot of people. Surprisingly, though, it's not just about those things. It's not just about the environment. It's also about nature. Breakthroughs in genomic technology have shown that certain uh, combinations of genomes uh, in your genetic sequences tend to foster certain uh, ways of behavior that are more likely to lead to political expressions of one kind or another. This does not mean that your genetics uh, determines your politics because we know that your genes will mutate in reaction to environmental uh, stimuli. So it's both genes and uh, nature, it's both nurture and nature. But it does mean that certain specific gene combinations, many times inherited from pa the past, might make a person, for example, more uh, aggressive or less aggressive, more uh, scared or less scared, which may, might translate to specific political general stances, fear versus optimism, preference for violence versus preference for avoidance of violence, that might become then coded in political parties. Your genes are not going to make you Republican or Democrat. They're not going to make you conservative or progressive. They're not going to make you uh, right wing or left wing, but they might make you more willing to support politics that increase safety versus politics that are more inclusive and so on and so on and so on. So why do we have such a big diversity of views? Why is public opinion so schizophrenic? Well, because as people we are divided on many things. We already talked about genes, but Economic self-interest, the interest of those who are affluent, let's say millionaires and above, and those who are poor are not the same. The poor want to redistribute wealth, uh, so they are not poor anymore. The rich want to avoid the redistribution of wealth. Partisanship and ideology. Some of us are liberal, some of us are conservative. Parties in the United States of America tend to be uh, promoting one or the other ideology, so we tend to become partisan, supporting a specific party against another, even if sometimes this is not practical. Our educations, people with university educations tend to have very different politics with people who did not get university educations. Our ages, your political ideas are going to be very different from my political ideas, and my political ideas are going to be very different from those of somebody who's 80 or 70 years old. De gender, men and women tend to think very different about the same political issue. Marriage, married people tend to have very different politics than single people. Race and ethnicity, people belonging to races that have faced racial prejudice in the past or ethnicities that have been persecuted by the state in the past tend to have different politics than those whose ethnicity or race has been protected and promoted by the state. Religion, atheism versus theism, uh, Baptists versus uh, Lutherans, Muslims versus Christians, and so on, that can have a big impact on politics. And geography, of course, rural Nevadas have different views than urban Nevadas in Las Vegas. Their politics are likely to be different. This is not a problem, this is a condition of democratic politics. The question is, can we make sure that we have enough of a common core that makes our democracy work? And that's the hard thing to make work in democracy. That is what requires the hard work. We're going to have differences. That's unavoidable. But can we solve them in a peaceful manner? And can we put them to the side sometimes to get things done? That's the question. Now, as I pointed out, uh, the best way and the cheapest way to capture public opinion is through opinion polling. This is based on the mathematical law of large numbers that says that if you have a truly random sample of a population, and if that random sample is big enough, then the statistical probability that the distribution of virus characteristics in that sample is exactly the same as that of the population, it will be very high. Indeed, you don't even need to know the numbers of the population. Uh, you just need to make a big enough sample. It's very important to have random samples. If they're not random and they're biased, then the opinion uh, polling is useless. And uh, we use sampling error and waiting to uh, address some of those issues. Uh, you can learn more about this in classes about uh, social science methods and specific dedicated classes to surveys. Again, if you're going for a policy degree, I would advise you strongly 
if you want to do a job in political science to study survey design and polling that is what politicians love they pay for that and companies also of course it's important to ask the right questions questions should not be ambiguous and should be on to on a topic the respondent knows or has thoughts about the ways that you can play about questions in order to prime the term is called the respondent to give you the answer that they want are nicely exemplified by this clip from the popular British series Yes Minister. Look it up, it's a very good clip in showing how exactly you can uh, manipulate public opinion. So he's going to say something new and radical in the broadcast. What that silly grand design? Bernard, that was precisely what you had to avoid. How did this come about? I shall need a very good explanation. Well, he's very keen on it. What's that got to do with it? <laughs> Things don't happen just because prime ministers are very keen on them. Neville Chamberlain was very keen on peace. <laughs> yes, he, he, thinks, he thinks it's a vote winner. Ah, that's more serious to done. What makes him think that? Well, the party who had an opinion poll done, it seems all the voters are in favour of bringing back national service. Well, I have another opinion poll done showing the voters are against bringing back national service. <laughs> we can't be for it. Oh, of course they can, Bernard. Have you ever been surveyed? Yes. Well, not me, actually. My house. Oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> well, Bernard, you know what happens. Nice young lady comes up to you. Obviously, you want to create a good impression. You don't want to look a fool, do you? <laughs> no. No. So she starts asking you some questions. Mr. Woolley, are you worried about the number of young people without jobs? Yes. Are you worried about the rise in crime among teenagers? Yes. Do you think there's a lack of discipline in our comprehensive schools? Yes. Do you think young people welcome some authority and leadership in their lives? Yes. Do you think they respond to a challenge? Yes. Would you be in favour of reintroducing national service? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I suppose I might. Yes or no? Yes. Of course you would, Bernard. After all you've told you, you can't say no to that. <laughs> so, they don't mention the first five questions and they publish the last one. Is that really what they do? Well, not the reputable ones, no, but there aren't many of those. <laughs> so, alternatively, the young lady can get the opposite result. How? Mr. Woolley, are you worried about the danger of war? Yes. Are you worried about the growth of armaments? Yes. Do you think there's a danger in giving young people guns and teaching them how to kill? Yes. Do you think it's wrong to force people to take up arms against their will? Yes. Would you oppose the reintroduction of national service? Yes. <laughs> there you are, you see, Bernard. The perfect balanced sample. So, we just commission our own survey for the Ministry of Defence. See to it, Bernard. There are many polls. Uh, the scientific polls are national polls trying to cover the whole population. Campaign polls that try to focus on understanding who is winning a political campaign. Benchmark polls that try to understand what people think about specific policies. And tracking polls that try to track public opinion on a specific issue over a long period of time. All of these are expensive. They provide very good data if you use the proper methods. And there are a lot of good political scientists that are paid a lot of money to do. Then you have non-scientific polls. These are pseudo polls. Those are the kinds of polls you get on TV, where the television person says, call us and tell us your opinion on this. Or a magazine says, why don't you participate in a poll that we set up? You see, in these cases, there is no random sample. It's biased. You choose to participate. See, in a random sample, you can refuse to participate, but your refusal is actually counted. In pseudo polls and push polls, that's not the case. New media organizations, opinion magazines, and politicians use this kind of pseudo scientific polls in order to push a narrative. Don't trust them and don't become part of them. You're taking part in line when you're participating in this. Stop it if you have been doing this. They don't deserve your time. If you want to participate in polls, participate in scientific polls. And finally, we have the very scientific polls, which are survey experiments. These are extremely expensive, usually done by big teams of university working academics. And they provide extremely detailed information and very accurate information of a, about a huge amount of views. The final point I want to make to you is so you understand why public opinion is so important. In general, as collectives, democratic publics make rational choices. And here's the example. Here are the results of the German federal elections of 1932 to 1933, the election that led to the rise of the Nazi party. 
Here's the thing. In 1930, the Nazis and parties supporting them got 18.25%. Not Nazi parties got 81.75% of the vote, the majority. Not radical parties, that means parties that were not seeking the overthrow of the Weimar Republic, got 40.85%. Okay? 1932, the pro-Nazi vote goes up to 37.27%, the not-Nazi vote is at 62.73%, and the not-radical vote goes to 39.42%, so it goes down. Uh, radicals include the Nazis as well as communists. In 1932, on the repeat election, the Nazis got less than they got in the original election, only 33.09%, not Nazi was 66.91%, but not radical, well, down to 35.45%. The majority of the German people did not ever vote for the Nazi party in elections. They understood those are idiotic, crazy people. The problem, though, is that the majority of the German people did vote for destroying the Weimar Republic, whether by communist or Nazi means. So there were, you know, keep that in mind. We make rational choices. Those rational choices do not always work out the way we want. You can trust public opinion, you can trust the democratic public, but you need to keep that majority that is loyal to the democracy high. You can never keep it completely high, but you need to keep it high. That is the duty of a democratic citizen that wants to participate in politics. Now, we don't have to take up that duty. You have the freedom not to care. You have the freedom to try to overthrow the system. But I'm just telling you what a democratic, political, ideal citizen does. That's public opinion. That's civil society. This lecture is done.